Welcome, everybody, to the Cone of Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Work. Guys, I got a good one for you today. We are talking about stress in cats. We have uh, a cat named Calix that is defecating outside the litter box when mom travels. It seems to have a stress component, but it needs to get sorted out. And so I have Dr. Leanne Lilly here with me to help sort that out. She is a boarded veterinary behaviorist. She is on the faculty at The Ohio State University. She is a great person to talk to. I really enjoy her. We get into a GI brain interface. We get into the biome. We get into stress management. We talk a lot about expectation setting with pet owners, which honestly, that's that was great. That was a really neat little pearl that I put in my pocket, and I'm going to I'm going to set some expectations with pet owners a little bit differently. I think that was really good for me. Anyway, you'll hear it. You can decide if it's good for you, but I loved it. This episode is made possible ad-free by our friends at Hills Pet Nutrition. If you have not checked out their learning platform, it's called Hills Veterinary Academy. I'll put a link in the show notes. It is a fantastic place to get your learn on. Guys, let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Leanne Lilly. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming on. For those who don't know you, you are a board-certified veterinary behaviorist. You are uh, you are an assistant professor of clinical. What well, do you say? Assistant professor clinical for behavioral medicine at the College of Vet Medicine at the Ohio State University. Is that yeah? Yeah, we usually leave out the College of Veterinary Medicine as it's sort of implied because that is the most long and gamely title that I yeah. think come across. It's like, I mean, it sounds I, really important, right? So many words, but yes. Yeah. I imagine the old cop shows where they would like whip their badge out and you have one, but then when you lip it out, it just folds and folds and folds <laughs> as your title keeps wrapping down. I love that you are here. You are, first of all, you are fascinating for a lot of reasons. You are so focused in low stress handling. You're fear-free, elite certified. You have done so much with uh, stress management in shelter pets. You have a lot of expertise and experience in, in the field of stress management, I would say. So how, what, how did you get into that? Was it a conscious decision? Is that something that has evolved over time? How did you just sort of decide to be the stress doctor? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. The sort of long version goes all the way back to when I was eight. And I was not one of those people who knew they wanted to be a vet when they were a kid because I'm actually a needle phobe. But I had a dog who had seizures most often during thunderstorms. And so that sort of jump started my foray into the brain. And then in vet school, uh, in undergrad, actually, I did an undergrad in biopsychology. So I studied the brain and behavior and neurotransmitters Then I went to vet school, and then because of that background, I started collecting all these patients who were nervous in the hospital or hard to handle in the hospital or had anxiety components at home because it was very comfortable reading about a medication and say, okay, well, what does it do? What does it bind to? Who does it talk to? Is that going to be helpful in this symptomatology? And as I collected more cases, then, of course, I got to the end of my knowledge base and then said, okay, there has to be someone who knows more about this than I do. Who are those people? Which is when I discovered the diplomats of the American College of Veterinary Behavior. I did a specialty internship and that sort of blossomed me further into that. And then I said, yes, this is absolutely what I want to do with my life. Went into residency and then I just hung on to academia because I love that ability to keep expanding the knowledge base, both for myself and for my students. And it gives me the opportunity to do things like study how behavior changes and how stress management and teach stress management. So that's kind of how I got here. That's amazing. I have got a case that I think you are uniquely qualified to <laughs> to talk about. Maybe not uniquely. You are super qualified. Not uniquely qualified, but super qualified to talk about. I've got this case. Can I bounce it off of you? Is that okay? Ab- absolutely. All right, cool. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old female spade domestic short hair named Calix. Uh, she's a calico. That's and spicy. she Yes, a little bit. A little, a little bit. She, you know... Technician faces don't necessarily light up when she comes into the hospital, but she's a sweetie in her way, in her special way. She is here because she's driving mom nuts with pooping outside the litter box. And what happens is 
it's it's mom travels. Mom travels for work. She goes away, and everything is fine. And then she goes away, or boyfriend comes over and stays for a weekend, or some other you know sort of small thing. Maybe some furniture gets moved, and now we're back to pooping out of the box again. And she's going back to the doctor, and they're doing a workup for GI stuff. She's had an internal medicine workup. There's really nothing significant that they can find. They've scoped the cat, and it's a lot of sort of vague. It's maybe it's IBS, maybe it's not, you know, we can't really tell a lot of sort of vague, vague symptoms and signs and and words like that being thrown around. And so she's really frustrated. Nobody likes to clean up extra cat poop. Exactly. And the thing that she's really grabbed onto is this, it's when I travel. And again, a lot of people will have the cats and they're like, oh, she's punishing me. And we know that that that's not real. But it's that type of vibe that she's, you know, she's like, this definitely seems correlated to my behaviors or me doing these things that she doesn't like. And so anyway, I, I'm talking with her. I want to do right by this owner. I, I want to try to fix this problem. I, I want to make sure this cat doesn't get vilified. Not that mom would try to do that, but you know what I mean? Like I, I want to I sure. do right by her as well. So, so let me just ask you about that and sort of lay it out and say, I'm looking at this case. I'm kind of walking into it. Dr. Lily, how do, how do you treat that? Yeah. So taking a good history and finding out and confirming that this really does happen with these changes in the environment, changes in the schedule, changes in routine does very much make me think that this is a stress related. Um, And I think what gets tricky about that is simply because we've identified it as a stress related problem doesn't mean that there isn't also a GI component to that stress-related problem, because every time we look at it, the GI brain axis gets more complicated and more interesting, and it talks to each other bi-directionally. So the stress can influence the GI tract, and the GI tract can influence the stress. And so maybe what we're having is the stress impacts the GI tract, and then we get a vicious cycle until mom returns. And then if mom is stressed, now we have more stress at home. So that can become really overwhelming for everybody in the household really quickly. And certainly anytime there's a change in stool, you want to do your due diligence and make sure nothing has changed because just because last fecal was normal doesn't mean this fecal is normal. Right. But if, if you're going through that cycle and we're, we're not getting what we need, then focusing on either the GI brain interface or the brain side may be very helpful in helping Calyx and this owner get to a much better place in that regard. I love the conversation, the GI brain interface. This is actually an area that I just sort of became aware of in the last year. And it's been rather amazing to look at what we can do with GI health to have effects on other parts of the body. And so I like this. Mom does not want to pay for any more fecals. And again, I I get it. And and we're always like, hey, just because it was normal last. I, I get yep. it. She's at that point. And so all of that makes sense. All of that tracks the cycle of the stress buildup, things like that. Where do you start to intervene? First of all, let me ask you about sort of getting this back on the rails. We have this cat and she's defecating outside the box and mom is bringing her in yet again. What are your sort of pearls? What are your favorite things for trying to get these stress cases kind of calm back down and back on the rails? Because let's be honest, coming into the vet clinic, is not helping this stress level that we have. Help me first to stabilize and then long-term management. Sure. So some of the stabilizing is going to end up being client education and client management, right? The cat is not doing this for spite. The cat is doing this because it's profoundly stressed out. It doesn't seem like it, but take it as a compliment. Your cat loves you that much. And that can help reframe things and calm things down so that you have the bandwidth to then start doing an intervention at the cat level. And then I really want to think about, is this cat's GI tract working as perfectly as it could either all the time or during stress? And then how can we support that stress? So that might include things like diet specifically for the GI tract because stress changes the microbiome. Even if we don't get diarrhea, stress changes the microbiome. Stress can certainly also decrease the rest of the the health function and lead to additional non-positive things. So hairballs, upchuck, this idea potentially of Pandora syndrome um, launched by Tony Buffington. So we also want to look at that stress side and that depending on the client, depending on the cat, that might be nutritional management of stress. Things like supplements and probiotics and the generally recognized as safe type of products and diets that are specifically for stress. We might think about how do we combine those two things. We might reach for medications. I find a lot of people are hesitant to do that for all the reasons that make perfect sense. Is the medication safe? There's a there's actually just a stigma about 
behavior and, and psychiatric modifying medications. Yeah. And how easy is it to get it into the cat? You know, we have a shortage of highly palatable flavored medications that are for stress, by which I mean we don't currently have any FDA labeled ones except for pregabalin, which is brand new. So if we can get something into the cat that the cat likes to eat and it's easy for the client and it helps address either the GI side or the brain side or both, that sounds and feels like maybe we could have one-stop shopping and a slam dunk for this case. When you start to look at this, and that definitely makes sense as far as a one-stop shop, let's be honest, convenience in cat medication is a is a big driver. I don't, I, I think convenience sounds like the wrong word, but it's, it's adherence, right? Can they actually do it? Yeah. And again, I tend to choose positive uh, thoughts about, you know, pet owners when they come in and say, everybody's doing their best. And it just, it's Absolutely. easier just to believe but that. But can we so, make it easier for them? Exactly. Do you find that pet owners are kind of open to these types of conversations around nutrition? Do you think you get buy-in? Are they like, yes, I like this. Or are they sort of skeptical that yet another food is going to help. In this case, you know, with Calix, they did some diet trials with internal medicine. Now, I, granted, it's not what we're talking about, but I don't know the pet owner necessarily differentiates what we're talking about from the diet trials that she did before. What is that conversation like? Yeah. So I think Bayern has probably been better in the last couple of years as the idea that your GI tract influences your body has become more public knowledge in the human side. But I think even without that, it's about getting specific about why this particular diet in this sense and, and recognizing that the hard work that they did to go through other diets and notice what those diets did and didn't do. So if you've done a hypoallergenic diet trial, say, yep, we tried a hypoallergenic diet, that diet you know, is designed to keep the immune system from flaring up in response to the food. And the great news is your cat doesn't need that highly expensive hypoallergenic diet. And that means that we have other options. The diet that we're talking about is potentially designed for whether we talk about a calming diet or a, a microbiome diet, right? Getting down into the details about what it's designed to do and how it does that and why that specific to calyx and why that may specifically help calyx in terms of the signs that we're seeing. If you have personal experience with those, I think that's really helpful. If you have little samples in the room and you can say, hey, we can even just see which one calyx likes to eat because guess what? None of these do any good in the dish. They have to get into yeah. the cat, right? Those things can really help buy in. If you set them down and the cat's like, I am absolutely going to gobble that up in the exam room. And normally calyx doesn't eat the exam room unless you whip out the high value churro. You're like, aha. All right, now we're starting to look at easy and potentially successful. So I think those conversations really are about bringing the client along for the details rather than glossing over them to try and help them meet you in the middle. Right? We have all this stuff in our heads that we know about these things and why those two things are different and why this food is different from that food and why a novel protein is different from a hydrolyzed diet. And it's really our job to bring the clients along in that information journey in a way that they understand. So that also means being willing to stop, pause and say, what do you know about? Or what was your experience with? Or have you heard of the term GI brain access, right? And see where they are and then try to find the stepping stones to bring them along so that what your thought process is actually makes sense to them. What is the client experience if we lean into like a biome diet or into a stress diet, something like that? There's a lot of there's a lot of nutraceuticals in the world that have been sold to people and pets, and, and some of them are amazing, and they work really well. And a lot of them, people are like, I don't really know if they helped or not. Sure. Um, if I want to set expectations for these types of diets and stress management cases, is this going to be a fairly stark uh, change in the patient? Is this something where they're probably going to see real improvement in a short period of time? Is this going to be a two-week process of kind of re-regulation? Like, what what are they going to expect to see when they get back home? And I know I know it's very case-specific, individual-specific, but just, how do you set their expectations of, I fed this 20 minutes after I working? got home and it, is it working? Yeah. Sure. So some of that depends on which diet you're using and the case and where your, where your, your target and your stress points are. So for Calyx, for example, if the stool gets a little bit soft every time we defecate outside the box because the boyfriend came over or we moved the furniture or we traveled, then we may actually see clinical improvement, at least in the stool quality within 24 hours, which to my end, 
that's great. The cat may still be defecating outside the box, but for the client, that means they're not picking up gross poop anymore. Yeah, now they're okay. picking up solid poop. And so you can highlight that as, right, here's your little ray of sunshine about that. Now, in terms of whether or not from a GI brain access, that's sufficient on its own to help the cat manage in the stressful situation, you won't know until the next stressful situation. And so I think that is a client expectation that you have to manage. I think the other thing is putting some objectives on that, right? If the last time Calix's mom traveled for four days, we had 27 incidents of poop. That's a lot of poop. Traveled for four days, we had four <laughs> poops. That cat's having diarrhea. Had four poops outside the box. And the next time they travel, we have one poop outside the box, right? That's improvement. And so we need yeah. to try and get those objective measures so we can have those good conversations because the client goal is always zero. And sometimes it takes us some finagling to get there. And so we want to be able to say, hey, we took five steps forward and it was amazing. I understand your goal is zero. We're going to keep working towards that. So those types of details and and adjusting those inside the case, I think is really helpful for both the client and for you, right? If you know that objectively, then when they come back in for their recheck, you can be like, ah, oh, four poops last time, like on average a poop per day out of the box. Next time we only had one out of the litter box. Maybe it was on the last day. Maybe it wasn't, doesn't matter, right? We're making progress. So those types of things can help both the client as well as you for your management because then you don't have to guess. That is exceptional expectation setting. I think it means it means it because you're exactly right. Their expectation is zero. I will feed them this food and and I will have no more problems. I think saying zero is our goal and know that it may take some time to get there. There are intermediate improvements that we're probably going to see before we get there. I just think that that's really smart communication. That's fantastic. All right, great. I really enjoy talking with you. I could sit here and ask you a million questions about the GI brain interface. And, and just, I this is an area I, I'm still really, truly, deeply interested in and I want to keep learning about. If someone is into, is, is someone's really into this conversation and they're like, I want to learn more about biome, I want to learn more about the GI brain interface and stress management. What, what are your favorite resources? Where do you send people? Yeah, so it depends a little on whether they're looking for client side or, you know, white paper side. Um, white paper side, of course, I'm biased to my colleagues. No offense to anybody else doing wonderful research out there. It's just that I got to see it develop on both sides. So I'm like, ooh, it's shiny. Um, so we actually have some pretty good papers on this coming out through JAVMA in the last couple of years. So that's actually relatively re readily accessible for the veterinary community. More research is coming out every day. So ask me again in six months, I'll probably have more places to look. I'll link up some articles and everything for people in the show notes, things like that. What did you like for client facing? So for client facing, things get a little bit messier um, because it's such a novel field. And so they change a little bit. Veterinary Partner has a couple of handouts about basic urine and defecation outside the litter box and that it's not first bite and those types of things. And I think that can be really helpful if it comes from multiple places. Um, they have some supporting documentation about IBD. Um, we have a handout. It should be available on the Indoor Pet Initiative that's called IBS. It's about stress with a little apostrophe ignoring the A because I'm a literary nerd. And I think that that's really helpful as a bite-sized piece of information to give people or to think about, okay, here's how someone else talked about this. How might I reframe that for my specific client? Because nothing is one size fits all. Yeah, absolutely. Liam, where can people find you online if they want to kind of follow your work and what you're up to? Yeah. So I have a LinkedIn page. Um, it's just my name, Emily and Lily. And then the clinic webpage does a pretty good job of, of keeping things up to date and posted for resources at the vet.osu.edu slash behavior page. So those are pretty good places to find out what I'm up to. That sounds fantastic. Awesome. I will put links to all that sort of stuff. Thank you so much for being here. Gang, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I hope you found something helpful and useful uh, that you can put into practice. So I have to go see Halix and get this sorted out. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Andy. And that's it. That's what I got for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Dr. Leanne Lilly for being here. Thanks to Hills Pet Nutrition for making this episode possible. As I said, if you haven't checked out the Hills Veterinary Academy, take a look at it. It's a great site. It's a great resource. Um, yeah, I just, um, I'm a big fan. Anyway, I hope you guys will have a look. Take care of yourselves, everybody. I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.